You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. What is up, good folks? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in for this one. This is a really great episode. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. And just like last time Scott came on, I enjoyed the Patreon conversation even more. We really, we really went into some weird territories that I don't think we've actually fully explored on this podcast before. So that was really, really fun. I think you're going to enjoy this main episode. If you are not familiar with Scott, I would suggest going back to his previous episode and checking that out. You'll get a little more familiar with him as a person and his company. And on this one, we, you know, we kind of go all over the place, but we talk about some updates to his amplifiers, what goes into that, and how that is unique considering the lifestyle that he leads. So yeah, I think you're going to really enjoy that. And yes, this Patreon episode is absolutely fabulous. So if you want to support the show and you want to get all that bonus content, that's the way to do it. You can go to patreon.com slash tone mob, or you can go in Apple podcasts and subscribe to the premium content there, whatever you would like. So yeah, with that out of the way, Let's get into this one with my dude, Scott from Templo. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar stuff occasionally, sometimes. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have returning Mr. Scott Strange from Templo Audio Devices. What's going on, man? Howdy. It's been a while. It has been a while. I feel like I feel like we last talked on the podcast right before everything imploded, pretty much. Like maybe it was a little oh, before wow. that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So it's been a, a longer than I thought, yeah. Yeah, cuz I think I think right after So for, actually, let's backpedal a little bit. For anyone who's not familiar with Scott and his stuff, Go back and listen to the first episode. Otherwise, a lot of this will be somewhat confusing because he <laughs> chooses to li- live a very unique and cool lifestyle, and we go we went into that pretty heavily on his first episode, which actually directly influences his products, so it all makes sense. But, you know, without d- rehashing that for everybody, just go back and listen to that and then listen to this one because we are going to be talking a lot about you know, what he's been up to these last few years. And I want to dig into that pretty extensively because I'm sure he has an experience that's uh, unlike most of us. So anyway, the quick version is you like to travel basically a Mm -hmm. lot in very unique ways. Maybe you can give the Cliff Notes version for those that haven't heard that first episode. Uh, I guess it started a long time ago, about uh, 12 years now on the road, but... I just like to change the scenery, you know, keep it interesting. I've mm-hmm. always been somebody who who likes to see everything that's out there. You know, I used to get like catalogs of like uh, this place called the Robot Store and look at all the parts and, and things like that. Just kind of see everything that's in the world. I've just always been curious. So I think changing locations is part of that as well. Learning different cultures and uh, languages, things like that have just kind of been interesting to me. So I, I like to keep it fresh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you pretty much, for the most part you go through periods where you live on the road essentially and just go from place to place, take everything as it comes and uh, just really just experience it all. But you also Mm -hmm. like to play guitar (laughs) while doing that. (laughs) And uh, that's why you've, you've made these amplifiers and some of the other devices you've, you've come up with. But yeah, since that is the cliff note, cliff notes version, when we last left off, basically it it felt like maybe a month later, maybe even less you basically hit the road again. You were when you, we've recorded. You were kind of at a home base, and then you hit the road mm-hmm. again. So, 
what has that been like these last few crazy years? Like, <laughs> did you end up having to uh, hunker down anywhere or what, what did that look well, like? Well, I actually, I got super lucky with this. It was, it's funny. It's like, uh, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate compared I think to a lot of different experiences, uh, through COVID and all that stuff. Uh, I actually hunkered down right before all of it started nice. and then stayed hunkered down in this. I had a workshop basically in the woods that had a workshop below when I was living above, uh, in on an island in on the west coast of Canada, it was beautiful. So it didn't really feel like anything was going on. Like I was just kind of in the woods working right. on stuff. Uh, and so I got to really dig into this uh, project and really work on the amp. And I built a few guitars. I built a bunch of uh, custom stuff. And I was there for about two years, I want to say. Uh, and then basically the landlord uh, said, "Hey, we want our building back. You have two months." And I went, "Well, I just did a run of Nomads. They're almost." Most of them are done. Well, you know, I, I'm kind of ready to keep moving. Like I originally, this project was just, I'd met this investor. I said, hey, I've got this really cool amp. I want people to have them, but I don't really want a day job. And so I was kind of hesitant. And then I ended up talking to him. And, and my plan was, I thought this was going to be a quick project. You know, like I make 20 amps, I sell them, I pay him back. I've got money to keep going and great. And then about a month in, I went, this is a long-term project. <laughs> so uh, that's why I started with the Rambler, which is the smaller one. And then I realized, okay, if I'm going to do this, like if I'm really going to do this, I'm going to make the best possible version of this that I can do. And that's why I went to the Nomad. The Rambler is an amazing amp, uh, but the Nomad is kind of the, the distillation of all the things that I would want in a perfect amp. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got into that. But then basically I did that for a while and I get this notice and I go, you know what? Great. I kind of want to move on anyway. I want to I, I love Mexico. I spent a lot of time there, but I hadn't in two years. And um, I thought this is the perfect excuse. So what I did was, uh, when they gave me my notice, I went and bought a school bus. And <laughs> and then As I you started do. for, yeah, and I started for guitars. I said, all right, I've got two months. I still have 20 nomads to finish and ship. I'm going to start for guitars right now. I'm going to start a bus project. So I bought a bus, I parked it, and then I basically spent... Uh, whatever, 16, 18 hours a day, I would wake up at, at noon and work from noon till sundown on the bus. Like I cut holes in the roof. I, I welded a deck on top. I, I gutted the whole thing and built like a house inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so I would do that all day. And then at uh, midnight, let's say, I would eat something and then I would work until four in the morning on the amps and the guitars and then wow. pass out. And I did that for, for two months straight. So it was, it was not very much fun, but it was, uh, I got a lot done. And then, uh, and then when time came to move out, I, I loaded up uh, the, the still almost finished guitars in the bus, and I drove around the west coast of Canada for about a month because I just needed some adventure. I'd been cooped up for two years. So I drove around in this bus. Uh, well, I think it was the, yeah, it was the fall of last year. Mm -hmm. And then I drove back to the coast. I sold the bus and used that money to go to Mexico for the winter, and I spent all, all this winter in Mexico. I'm really curious what the person who bought the bus's plan was. Was he going to do something <laughs> similar or, or, or they, whoever it was? I don't know. It was, uh, it was a guy who he bought it and threw a wood stove in it. And then he parked it at like a ski hill and he lives in it. Uh, he lived in it for the winter at a ski hill, I think. Oh, nice. That actually sounds kind of yeah. nice. I like that. That's yeah. <laughs> it was nice. I had a kitchen in there, everything but a bathroom, which I don't think you, don't, you really want to go to the bathroom in a vehicle you're living in, unless it's a really long bus. Uh, yeah, you know, that gets into a whole tank system and a whole another thing. That <laughs> yeah, I lived on a sailboat. You don't want to sleep three feet away from your toilet. No. It's not fun. No, not a good thing. Not a good thing. I've, I've done a, a little bit of uh, RV travel, and it was always funny to me as a kid where dad's like, don't use the toilet unless you absolutely have to. And I was like, but why? It's it's right there. It's for <sighs> It's what it's for. And then as I got older, I understood, like, yeah, because he was going to have yeah. to deal with it, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, we're bringing it with us. Yep. Yeah. It's coming along for the ride. Things you'd rather leave behind, but it's coming along with us. Yeah. No, it was so, it was a great time. That bus was awesome. That's, that's super cool. Do you have any uh, photos of it? I do on my personal Instagram. So if you're one of the two people that crosses over from my business to my personal, you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go uh, check that out later. But it was it was just a, sh a short school bus. I painted it turquoise, and then I built a like a welded a. So I I can't weld, but what I did was I went like I, I'm I'm pretty uh, uh what's the word 
and, and resourceful, if you will, because I didn't want to spend a bunch of money because these things cost, you know, when people flip buses, they cost like 30 grand or something like this. So right. I went to this junkyard and got some steel beams and then I got a, uh, a saw from the thrift store and I just put a metal blade on it. I cut all the metal myself. Sorry about that. And, uh, and, and then I went to the welding shop and I said, hey, can, can we do this for cheap? And the guy said, well, uh, I'm expensive, but I have my apprentice here. And if basically you sign this, just sign a paper that says you won't sue us, you can help him. And then we'll only charge you for his time. So I ended up doing like a whole uh, thing for the roof. And it was nice. It was like a whole roof deck. So I had a second story above and it was, yeah, I loved it. A little hatch in the middle of the bus and the shelves were also a ladder. So you could pop through the middle and there you go. have a bed on the roof. Yeah, it was great. Nice, nice. That's That honestly sounds like, like, I, I got too much baggage now, but back in the day, I could see myself yeah. kind of enjoying that. Even though I'm not a road trip guy, as we discussed ex- extensively on the original episode, uh, I can see the uh, the appeal with a nicely set up bus mm-hmm. and just sleeping out on top of the roof. That sounds kind of nice. I can I can dig that. Yeah, and I had a, I think eleven guitars stuffed in there. Whoa! Yeah, Were they all ones you made. Like, there was four that I was finishing from the shop. So I did everything except for like the fret dressing and all the final setup. Uh, and then a couple I made, a bass I made, an acoustic I made. And then, yeah, I just had a, like under the bed was just stuffed with guitars. I had them, you know, a little rack for guitars, one hanging without a case. There's just guitars <laughs> everywhere, but they were kind of tucked away. So if you looked inside, you go, oh, he's got one guitar. But once I opened the back and pulled everything out, there's, yeah, I think 11 at one point and a drum kit. <laughs> It's like a Russian <laughs> yeah. doll of musical instruments yeah. that just keeps coming. Yeah. They're, they're never all end. the storage space. That's fantastic. Yeah. So then I take it, you know, you, you were working with that investor. You were planning on this being a short-term thing. You realized it mm-hmm. wasn't. Now are you pretty much like, okay, this is what I do now. Or are you still yeah. trying to like travel around and like, how, how are you doing all this? How are you balancing this? Well, that's the thing is that's the word. I'm trying to find that that spot for the pendulum to rest in a, in a place where I can do both. And that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, going to Mexico was nice for the winter, but I almost got no work done. I mean, there was still kind of logistical stuff or or planning or, or working on the new design. Like I would call my friend back home and say, hey, try this. You've got, you know, a soldering iron and stuff. Try this out and tell me what that sounds like and see if that would work for this. Or So I'm trying to, you know, because when I'm on the road, like I was in Mexico and I had an apartment for about four months, but I didn't really have access to, you know, I couldn't have parts shipped to me easily or or uh, go to the local electronics store or anything like that. I was kind of in a beach town. Uh, I know hard life, but uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of hard to get work done. So right. uh, then I come back, like I've been back to Canada for about a week and a half now. And since I've been back, all I've been doing is working. Like I go to my friend's house every day. We, we work on the circuit. I'm on, you know, designing stuff for the website and all that. So I'm trying to find that sweet spot where I can I can do both. Yeah. Yeah, because it does seem like logistically you would need somewhere solid set up, semi-permanent at least, to fulfill out of, to build out of all of that jazz while sil- simultaneously trying to maintain your sanity uh, because you do mm-hmm. like to wander around. So it, it's it's a hybrid approach that I think is achievable, but it definitely is going to require a lot of you know resourceful thinking on, on your part, which you're used yeah. to. Well, it's it's interesting because this whole process has been uh, almost like serendipitous in a way where people come into my life right when I need them. I'm I'm freaking out because I'm like, how am I going to pull this off? And then I go, like, for example, this week, I was like, hey, I'm going to go catch up with an old high school friend I haven't seen in 10 years. I go see his new restaurant. And I go, I start chatting with him. And, and he's like, oh, I'm actually, uh, I have an online store. I have my own warehouse here. I do fulfillment. I was like, oh. Cool. Oh, you don't Maybe say. we can work together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like just people show up and they're like, hey, can I offer you exactly what you needed right now? And I'm like, wow, that's that's wild. So like I had a friend also who was really into like Instagram ads and how to do all that. And he'd studied kind of that for his band. And I was like, hey, you want me to make you cool gear and you can help me just do that stuff because I'm busy designing, running this, doing, you know, everything else. Mm-hmm. So yeah, people just show up at the right time, which has been really cool. And people believe in the project, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a hole where this type of thing is is concerned. And still, even, you know, it's been several years since we first talked, and it still hasn't really been filled in the way that you're filling it. And uh, Yeah. 
That's, I hope nobody catches on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. But uh, What's this so, Defender Nomad? <laughs> Defender Nomad. <laughs> it looks just like, wait a minute. Hey, that actually could work out good for you. You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. Like if, uh, yeah. Maybe. Hey, Fender, you listening? Anybody listening right now? <laughs> no, somebody at Fender is listening to this right now. I but, think I wrote uh, somebody tangentially connected, yeah. So where do you have like sort of a, a plan moving forward with all of this? I know we've talked about it a little bit on the Instagram DMs, but how are you planning on both operationally and, you know, for the end consumers, what's this going to look like as far as trying to get their hands on this amp? And we should probably just talk about the amp specifically because you've made some updates to it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I'm kind of like, I'm just playing catch up with this because my, like the, my, my spear point is not let's make money. Let's have a business. Like I'm an entrepreneur. My, my main driving focus is I just want this to exist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to be the guy to, to be making them or to be doing all this, but somebody has to do it. Uh, cause I want one of these amps basically. So I'm, <laughs> I'm also a customer. Um, so I was at a point where I was just like, you know what? It's it's pretty finished. Why don't I just like sell this to some big company and go retire to an island? But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Not uh, usually. You really no. have to no. You have to develop the product to a point where basically it's selling itself, and then you just hand them over the already running business. And I was like, well, if that's going to happen, I might as well just keep going uh, because then I get to control it. Because once you hand it over, you know your baby, it can they can just do whatever, and maybe quality goes down or they don't care about certain things. Like to me, there's a lot of things about this amp that are important. And that's why we did these updates. Like, so I made this amp and I did the best I could in terms of, you have to make compromises too when you're manufacturing. Totally. You know, if I was making one amp for myself, I would put as, you know, I'd try throwing tubes in there and try doing all this crazy stuff uh, because I'm only doing one and I can pull it off. But to do a lot of them, I, I learned a lot in that process. And there was kind of certain, I wouldn't say corners you'd have to cut, but there's certain concessions you have to make when designing these things. And so I did that. I did a sort of like a digital style, like a Belton style reverb, uh, just as a courtesy, because I was like, I use my own reverb pedal that I like, but not everybody has one. So I'll throw a reverb in there. I'll throw a mic input. And they weren't amazing. Like the mic was just kind of, I call it a courtesy mic for, let's say my friends are in Mexico, they're playing a show on the beach and they've only got the one amp. Well, at least you can plug in and get some vocals. They won't sound crisp like through a PA, but you have something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of who I had in mind, but there's also the whole other market of people who like, I don't know, have access to maybe better gear and, and they're more discerning with the, the tones and all this stuff. And so I wanted to kind of meet all of those things, which is a big challenge. So I said, all right, if we're going to do another run, I want to improve all these things that I was kind of, you know, it was almost losing sleep over. I lay, I lay in bed at night and go, damn, the mic just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't make me want to play. That's what I want. You want a, a thing that makes you want to, you know, get up and go over to it. You don't know why, but let me just flick that amp on for a couple of seconds and, and play so I feel better today, you know? Yes, totally. That's kind of, exactly, that's what we're all about. Uh, that's what kind of why we all do this, the obsession. But, um, so I said, it has to have, let's go to Spring Reverb. It's going to be a pain in the butt. It's going to be more expensive. Uh, we're going to have to redevelop all this stuff, like basically pull that whole section out and redo it. Uh, and let's get the mic working. And then the tone of the amp, while good, a lot of people really liked it, there's a couple of people like, you know, it doesn't work with my P90s or it doesn't sound great in this context. And I was like, I want it. I want this amp to be everything for everyone, which is a big order. And I don't think I'm going to achieve it, but I can at least shoot for that. Yeah. And so we started looking at tone and, and all this stuff. Cause so I, just to kind of give you some, some insider secrets, I'm developing this, but there's a guy behind the scenes who doesn't want money, doesn't want fame. He just is like obsessed with tone. He, he has this basement workshop and he just builds the craziest things you've ever seen, the best tube amps, all this stuff. And we talk about five or six times a day. And he's the guy that's been helping me. Like we go back and forth. So I go, hey, what if we did this? And he's like, well, here's this old schematic from this thing. And maybe we could borrow this idea and make it work. And then I, mm -hmm. I call him and I go, you know, I just called him right before. And I was like, oh, he's, he's calling me right now. <laughs> uh, but because uh, I was just about to call him and say, hey, do you think if we turned the feedback resistor down and put this up, we'd get more reverb, but cleaner? You know, like that's, we're just doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we, I said, like, should I put one tone control? Because, you know, it's just easier or a three stack. And, and so we went over this and there's just choices you have to make, like for the size of the chassis and the size of the amp. Okay, we'll just put one tone control. And that ended up uh, kind of biting me in the butt. So 
all that to say, I came back and put this this other tone control idea that we implemented that can kind of like give you a little mid scoop or bass cut. And that just opened the thing right up. Like now it just sounds a lot clearer because of like the size of the cab and the way we're using it. Like we're using a class D power amp mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. It's not uh, sonically, like they sound kind of like flat EQ. Yeah. So they're definitely. not like magical tube sounding, but they're very efficient. They're very loud uh, and they, they work great for the job. But so this just kind of opened it up and just makes it sound awesome. Like I, I keep walking across the room and just flicking it on and go, oh, I didn't realize I'm playing now. Or I just like that that draw to it, which is really nice. <laughs> with the, so, And with the real spring. Yeah. So how do you go about, because PAs and guitar amps, they're while they both amplify sound and make things louder, mm-hmm. they're definitely voiced completely different. PAs are generally trying mm-hmm. to just be as neutral as possible to just to capture whatever is being fed to them. And guitar amps have character. That's why we mm-hmm. all like certain amps or don't like certain amps. They have their own voice and their own character to them, which doesn't tend to make a great PA most of the time because, you know, all of a sudden you're plugging a microphone in and you sound like this, you know, like because yeah. it's it's got a different character because our voice is not a guitar pickup. So mm-hmm. how do you make that crossover? Did you just end up eliminating the microphone or d- did you figure out a way to make it work? Well, so we kept the mic. I didn't want to do an Apple move because I make the, the splice pedal, by the way. They just came in. They got these cool boxes. Nice. Uh, but the splice pedal was kind of for my solution for my board to mix my voice and my guitar together because I wanted to go into my looper first for like beatboxing or, or through reverb and different things. So I never really used the mic input in the amp, but I didn't want to be Apple and be like, oh, buy the buy the cable separate kind of thing. Like Get if, the dongle. if you need to do yeah. a certain, yeah. yeah. So I, I left the mic because I'm like, you know what? Somebody's going to use it. It's going to be useful. And what I did was we went through a few ideas. One of them was putting a whole separate power amp in just to run a tweeter for the mic and, right. and to route that through. And that seemed a little like we'd have to redesign the cab. And, and so that was a bit much. And what I ended up doing was throwing the EQ stack from the splice into the Nomad and then setting it with uh, trim pots internally. But again, like I'm learning all this about manufacturing. If you go to, let's say, have a factory make those circuit boards for you, they're not going to have a guy there turning your your trim pots inside mm-hmm. to exactly. I mean, they could. It, it just it makes it very inefficient and expensive to have a guy like dial in your tone of the factory. So what I did was I dialed it in on the prototype, and then I'm putting set resistors. So we're basically putting a set EQ inside it, but I'm leaving the mid as a... Uh, as a trim pot inside so that if ever you do want to kind of do some mids, which is probably the bigger, biggest impact on the mic through this circuit, you yeah. can still kind of open up your amp and tweak a little if it just doesn't sound exactly the way you want. But I just dial it in so you're as clear as you can be through this uh, the speaker without losing bass, basically. Mm-hmm. What speaker did you end up going with? That's a good question. So this is, I kind of have, I have this conflict. I'm going to be as, as honest as I can about this because like, so I'm I'm now looking at having manufacturing done overseas. Mm-hmm. And when we say overseas, we're talking about China. And and there's always this huge, like, oh, it's made in China, so it's not as good. Like, the, the Made in Canada label that I've had, because it's mostly made in Canada, has been, you know, people like, oh, it's better quality. But the thing is, the the, the PCBs are made in China. The, the components of most circuit boards are made in China. And going there is, it's an interesting choice, but... As long as, so I'm going through Gorva. I don't know if you know Gorva. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's doing great stuff, but his quality standards are super high. So I went with him and I said, let's do this in China, but let's make it, you know, really, really good. And and my biggest issue was I was just going to have them do the chassis and then I would source my speakers, which up till now have been Jensen's. Yeah. And they were like custom made in Italy for me. And that's, it's like, oh, great. They're Jensen's. They're, they're amazing. There's no question about it. I don't have to prove these speakers are great. Um. Uh, and I said, the only question about like them making the whole amp in China is, can I have those Jensen's made and shipped to China? And they're like, we don't do that. So right now what's happening is it turns out they have, because I use neodymium speakers, the neodymium mm-hmm. magnet, for weight, because it cuts the weight of the amp down like by a third. And now they're doing great things with the technology so that they actually sound comparable to a ceramic right. uh, or al Nico. Like they sound really like good, but maybe six years ago, 10 years ago, they didn't sound good. But it makes a huge difference in the weight of the amp. Like from a, like, oh, my arm hurts to you can pick it up with your pinky kind of thing. Yeah. So depending on how strong your pinky is, of course. Uh, <laughs> but 
so now he said they've got, you know, maybe 10 different uh, neodymium speakers in, in China. So they're going to send me a whole bunch. I'm going to try a few, and then they're going to tailor it to the cabinet and all that stuff. So we're basically going to have custom speakers made uh, in China, and I don't know how that's going to go. But I'm going to make sure that they, they sound good before I, I sign off on them. Because to me, like... Saving money is great and making an affordable amp is good. Like there's all these priorities, right? You want the amp to be accessible. People keep saying, oh, that price is really reasonable for what it is. Uh, you can make it more expensive. And I don't really want to. I don't want to make more money because I can. I want people who need this amp to be able to buy it. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah. mean, I, I definitely want to cover my costs and I want to make enough money to continue living doing this, but I don't need to be profiteering. So there's all these variables when making this thing then. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you have to imagine that the primary user of this amplifier, because it is portable, like it's totally made with, I mean, busking, essentially, in mind. Mm -hmm. You have to imagine that the, the target customer for this isn't swimming like Scrooge McDuck through, you know, <laughs> gold coins everywhere. You know, it's not, not really happening. Uh, so trying to get it to where it is accessible, as accessible as possible... Mm -hmm. is the move because you know the blues lawyer might find this interesting but they don't really need it you know they're gonna go get a matchless you know <laughs> like that's that's yeah. what their their target is so making but it affordable will one, get it to more people you know yeah but if they buy one i want them to also go you know what this holds its own like yeah it's affordable rips. but wow mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. and that's that's number one right is 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 this has got to be awesome and then the rest is details. Yeah. But then after that, it's like, yeah, it's got to be accessible. Um, yeah. And, and so and that's I'm just really hard to do. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's really hard yeah. to, to make literally any kind of good quality audio product that isn't, you know, pricey to most people. Because mm -hmm. it's just hard to do. There's so many different things that go into it. There are so many different concessions and considerations you have to make and you know nothing's ever going to be exactly perfect and hit every single mark you're always going to have to like like well okay this pot yeah is a little bit better but it's worse for this reason you know it maybe it feels yeah. better but like it's not as uh the it's not as accurate or like maybe you know like you said like the ceramic speakers sound really great this is really cool but now the amps you know way heavier and that defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's always yep. things you're you're having to look at and analyze and and it goes with I, I think a lot of people don't understand how much time just goes into trying to make a good looking appealing box to put it in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like so many different things. 90% angles. of my job is that is is just thinking of all that and weighing everything and going, do I do this or do I do that? And yeah, it hurts. Like it's a lot of brain work. The the physical stuff isn't as bad. Like I actually, on the last run, I did all my math and I went, oh, I'm making, I'm making money in these amps. I did not uh, count my hours at all. <laughs> so I did all the assembly, all the vinyl wrapping, this, like even the speaker grill cloths in there with the blowtorch like melting and tamping down the corners and mm -hmm. hair dryer shrinking them. That's a little secret in case you want to tighten up your grill, by the way, is the hair dryer. But yeah. I did all of that and I didn't count my hours. So I'm looking on paper, I'm adding up. I go, okay, vinyl costs this much. The circuit boards cost this much. The batteries those are the two biggest expenses on the amp is the battery pack and the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, like my cost on a Jensen speaker is 75 US at wholesale. Right. So that, yeah. that's like, what is that? That's about a quarter of the sale price of the mm -hmm. amp. Yeah. Uh, so, and then the battery is about the same because mm -hmm. I'm not uh, cheap on the batteries either. And that's one of the big questions I get to is how long does the battery last? And the real answer is I don't know because I charge mine once a month. Wow. And, and my, yeah, well, I don't play like, so I don't play to, to be honest, I don't play, you know, five hours a day, but I'll go and turn it on and noodle for half an hour, like every day. Mm -hmm. So it la it's about this big and it's the same cells as they put in Tesla's, the 18650s. Mm -hmm. uh, lithium ion I got, things. Yeah. Yeah. Lithium mm -hmm. ion. And there, I had a pack, I have packs made. I put a little indicator on them, but they last forever, which is, and that's what I wanted. Cause I was talking to, to my friend and I was like, Hey, we could take one cell out and take, you know, two amp hours off. Uh, what do you think? He's like, no, go for the, go for the huge battery. Keep it, you know, 
you've set a standard now for battery life. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and yeah, I think, like, I get to come back to your point about busking. It's interesting because people say like, oh, is it, it's a busking amp. And I try and shy away from that because I, I, I've done a lot of busking in my life. I don't really do that much anymore, uh, which is a luxury really, because, you know, if you're busking, it's because you probably need to. Right. Uh, or you enjoy it. But I mean, that's, a, it's a job, right? Busking's a job. Totally. And, and, uh, and I don't want re- people to really think about this as a busking amp. I want them to think it's a great busking amp, but I'm trying to uh, make it so it's a great everything amp. Like if you only had to own one, I would want it to be this one because mm-hmm. of all the boxes that it checks, right? Like, so I have jazz players who are like, hey, this thing's really clean, really loud and really light and small. And I can just carry to my gig on the train. Perfect. You know, exactly. It's battery powered. So there's no 60 cycle hum. So I can go right. to the recording studio and have no hum from this amp. And run all my pedals hum free off of it too, so like I'm trying to like check all those boxes for people. Well, and you know, talking about that specifically, if you are a jazz player, you know, going around to New York City, for instance, you know, they like it loud and clean and noise free. And mm-hmm. you plug in at some of these old clubs with the old janky wiring and stuff, and you're not gonna be clean anymore. Like, in, yeah, in many many cases. You're going to have some ground loop somewhere, you know, somebody running a, a their hair dryer in the apartment upstairs and it's going to influence you downstairs. Like there's all kinds of different it things. It sounds like and Mexico. With, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, this takes care of that. You don't have to worry about it. You just grip, throw it on stage yeah. and you're, you're ready to go and you don't have to worry about any of those problems. So that is a, so I think that's something that's not really talked about with battery power specifically. It's super clean. Yeah. There's no no interference with that kind of stuff. It's fun sometimes to be like in the middle of a jam and just pick up your amp and just walk over to the other side of the room. You know, (laughs) just move around while you're playing. Confuse everyone. What what is he doing? You could even strap it to your back, to be honest. Like you could throw it in a backpack, you know, and leave a a hole or something and just walk around with it on your back. How much does it weigh? What's the overall weight on the new one? I think it's 12 pounds, I want to say. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I've got one here. 12 pounds. That's I have guitars that are almost that much. So Yeah, yeah it's about a Les Paul. It's about a Les Paul weight. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all. That That's actually really nice for gigging. That's super nice. Let me see if I yeah, you can see... The, uh, you can audibly see with the right. sound waves. For anybody watching, there's the magnets. Very small. It's like a hockey puck size. Yeah, instead yeah. Instead of a, a dinner plate size. And there's the battery in there, which is also And that quite cover huge. just pops off. Is that Velcro? Is that what's going on? Yep. Nice. For oh, the good. audio audience, he pulled the back cover off of the amplifier and showed me the little tiny speaker magnet. So there you go. Yeah, the behind the scenes view. Mm-hmm. So moving forward with this, once the amp's done, once it's dialed in, it's everything's up and running as you are hoping that it does. Mm-hmm. Is there more products is there other ideas that you have that you're wanting to explore is there other things you're looking at or are you kind of gonna just roll with this for a while and, and see how it does uh, that's a that's a great question uh, i think the process of this i kind of got caught up in this process and now my brain's like what else can i do what else can i you know watch too many of those inspirational videos and i just have a <laughs> list now of of like things i want to make and because I'm learning the manufacturing process and the development process, you can just throw something now into that formula. And I have a little bit of a network now. I have a guy I, I go to to say, how do I solve this little noise here or this problem? I have a guy to go to to say, hey, can you do a, a circuit board layout? So I kind of have this this road that I've cleared to, to be able to bring things from my brain to a store or to your pedal board kind of thing, which is really neat. So I go, what else can I make? What is necessary. And that's kind of always been my approach is where are the holes? Because mm-hmm. I could go and make a distortion pedal, but not only has it been done a million times, there's all this competition for it. You wouldn't get, a, even if it was the best distortion pedal in the world, nobody would know because there's so much noise out there. So I go, okay, well, what is nobody doing? Cause then I can be the best at that. Right. Uh, and that's what I've done in other fields in my life as well. You just pick something that nobody else is doing and then, you know, <laughs> hop to the front of the line. So <laughs> Uh, there's a couple ideas I have. People have been asking me for a bass version of the Nomad. That's, uh, but that's a little bit down the road. Bass actually sounds great through it already, which is lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but yeah, I want to do a, a version of the the Nomad for bass with like a kind of a built-in compressor or limiter. Um, and then, so I was talking to my friend who was helping me with my Instagram ads, and I ended up making him a, uh, in collaboration with my buddy Dave, who's been helping me, we made him an 1176 compressor. Mm -hmm. And we, we built him like an old school style one, and he loved it. He's like, I throw this on everything now. And he, I think he does um, soundtracks for movies and stuff. So he was just in love with this thing. And I went, like I saw his passion for it, and I went, I've got to figure out how to now share that with other people and like make something like that. And so my next idea, I should really wait till it's more finished to, to share it so people don't steal it, but it's coming down the line. I've already had two or three prototypes that we've made. Uh, it's just once the Nomad's finished, I can kind of dive into it, but it's basically going to be a, uh, I call it the pocket studio compressor. So it's Ooh. all the features of a, like a, like a desktop or a studio compressor, but in a pedal which mm -hmm. has been done, compressor pedals have been done. But um, the idea is it takes uh, XLR and quarter inch in and mm -hmm. out. So yes. you can go, and it's got phantom power. And so what that means is you can do a bunch of things with it. So you can also, there's also a dry mix, so you, and then the attack release and, and level and all that stuff. You can change the ratio and there's a VU on it. But the main thing is that because it's got phantom power and you can also power it with phantom power, you can, it's super versatile. Nice. You power with phantom power or nine volts from a pedal board. And it's set up so, and there's a foot switch on it. So this way, it's top jacks for your pedal board. And then this way, it's XLR through for like on your, on your desktop. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so what you could do is you can use it as a DI. You can use it as a just a phantom power source if you bypass it. So if you have a condenser mic and you want to power it with a little preamp, you can use it for that. And then you engage the compressor and now you've got compression on it. So if you're doing podcasts or YouTube stuff or anything, you can kind of put it in there. And then the circuit is, uh, yeah, just designed to be really noise-free and a really smooth sounding compressor. We're like dialing in the sound. And so it's more about utility. Like I, I start from the end of the user first. Yeah. Right? So you go, what do I need to accomplish? You know, what are the uses of this? And then I work backwards from there. Mm -hmm. I love the sound of that. That sounds awesome to me. I, I've been trying to make an effort to, when I'm recording, to remember to put a DI track out on everything because mm -hmm. I'm getting more into, uh, I know, I know everyone's going to call me out for this. I'm getting more into the digital uh, amps and stuff and because it's just, they've improved so much. And I always find it really nice to be playing with the amps in the room, letting that air move around me and blow around. But sometimes, especially when I'm doing heavier guitars, it's nice to have a DI track out so I can play around with a bunch of high gain amps that I don't have in post mm -hmm. and mix them in with the original signal and just and get just a huge variety of different sounds. So I've been a big DI guy over the last probably year and a half. And so like this sounds incredibly flexible and incredibly cool for I can think of a bunch of different use cases for this just right off the top of my head, even not even not even considering the really nice compressor that's in it too. So yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, cause it's, it's that those things that get my brain going, like my brain is a problem solver to the mm -hmm. point that, you know, uh, people don't like being around me because I, I try and improve everything. And I really got to work on being more com <laughs> complimentary, you know, finding things that are working fine and pointing them out like, Oh, that's, that's a great thing. But instead I'm like, here's how you can fix this. Here's how this is improved. So <laughs> my brain is always doing that. Girls hate it. Uh, and and so it's really fun for me to go. Okay, I've got a Zoom, and I'm I'm at this live show. Like I'm thinking again of Mexico or of situations I've been in where we're on this like pallet stage in the back of a mojito bar, and all the friends are jamming and rocking out. It's noisy. There's bad electricity, and I go, I want to capture this in a really professional way. That would work. Is you go, you know, take a line out, go through this nice compressor, and then into my Zoom or something like that. I mean, Zooms do have built-in compressors, but I'm just thinking in terms of situations that I'm in where I go, what would I need to do this or I've had friends ask me like, oh, I have a condenser mic, but how do I power this on stage? And I go, well, right. this would work there. And you'd also smooth it out a bit because, you know, maybe they don't know how to work the system or whatever. I guess you'd be fighting with the sound guy to, to see who's doing all the levels and stuff. But just these situations where where you need something that doesn't exist mm -hmm. or or that does exist, but isn't very common. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. That's a that's something that 
yeah, I'm just, you got my brain going. I'm like, wow, I can think of so many different things to use it for just in a regular studio. That's really cool. Very, very cool. And that's the same with the splice too, is like, there's kind of scenarios, like, it's the same with uh, any kind of adapter, really. If you got like an adapter from headphone to quarter inch and you're like, you know, you're sitting there, you're trying to just pull off something, you know, you're doing a home recording or you're in a weird scenario and you go, oh, I need to plug this into that thing. How do I do that? How do I... Mm -hmm. mesh these things together. And so that's some of my tools can be used in that way as well, which is nice because you're always, you're always scrambling and you're trying to MacGyver something together sonically. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that I suffer from really badly is, you know, I tend to chase like the exciting things like, oh, cool. There's a new Chase Bliss pedal or cool. This new really mm -hmm. awesome fuzz just came out or this, you know, thing that is, you know, more, <sighs> more obviously like intriguing, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. new guitars, new, you know, whatever. But some, <laughs> this happens to me every time I'll buy, I'll put off buying boring things, quote unquote, boring mm -hmm. things like this boom mic arm here. I'll, I put it off for mm -hmm. years. I had this stupid little stand on my table. I mean, it's not stupid, but it was made for, you know, miking an amp. And so it was big and heavy and like not easy to position where I needed it. And, I just fought with it for years and years. Finally, I got this boom arm and I attached it to my table and was just like, Rrr. and I was like, you know, I do oh. this every time, every time I, I bought like five different or maybe even seven, I think was the number. It's like seven different fuzz pedals. When I first started getting into pedals before I bought a tuner, mm -hmm. I finally bought a <laughs> tuner and I was like, well, this makes life a lot easier. I just like, you don't need I to be in tune do with that. that much fuzz. <laughs> That's true. You just keep <laughs> keep stacking it. It'll be fine. But it's yeah. after it's five just, fuzz pedals, you can't tell. <laughs> oh, somebody can. You know, <laughs> the trolls on the internet, they can tell. They they know what's going on. But yeah, it's it's the boring stuff sometimes though that makes the biggest difference in yeah, your or, recording. Or simplicity. Yeah. Or or and sometimes getting you to that point where you're actually able to do the creating. You know, mm -hmm. you'll pull something out of yourself faster and e more easily than if you didn't have that thing. And I, I do this with not just musical stuff. I'll, like, deal with a loose drawer for years before I, like, tighten the knob up. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that was easier. I'm It's a flaw. I'm trying to work on it with myself, but there's I don't a, think I'm alone. There's a concept called the paradox of choice, and it's that basically uh, if you have – we think it's a good thing to have lots of choices – but our brain doesn't actually like that. And it's a lot easier to make a decision when you have fewer choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I find that same thing as like, because when I met my buddy Dave and I, I see this whole wall of pedals he's built and he builds crazy things into lunch boxes and all kinds of weird things and there's no labeling. I go, what does this do? What does this do? What does this do? And you're like a kid in a candy store and you discover all these different things and you, you, you always make your pedal board huge and then eventually you kind of distill it to what you actually use and instead of being like in a in a cockpit of a pilot you know, of an airplane trying to <laughs> dial in all this stuff, and you're like, when am I actually playing music? And so it's nice to come down to like just a few pedals, and even sometimes you know, like just plug right into the amp, and you go, oh right, this is why I do this. This mm -hmm. is you know kind of the purest expression of this. So yeah, uh, some of that stuff is boring, but I find too like just getting back to just a few simple things, and that's why too like there's a few other things that I wanted to design, and I thought let's just keep it. You know, like as, as few things between you and music as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, that is true. The paradox of choice is a real thing. And I, you know, I am a gear hoarder and collector. And sometimes I do just like, I'm just plugging into the amp today, which I don't think anybody mm -hmm. would probably expect from me. But sometimes I do mm -hmm. just plug straight in and, and let it rip. Because sometimes I like, I only have 20 minutes. I don't have, mm -hmm. you know, two hours to set up a full new rig like I normally would do and run all these crazy pedals and things, which is, I love doing that. But sometimes it's like, I really want to play and I only have a little bit of time. And sometimes those well, are the you most... Have a, you have a kid, the, the, right? I, yeah, I have two. Yeah. Oof. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's going to make it tough to find that time. Uh, you know, it can be, but fortunately, you know, this is what I do for a living. So it's a little bit easier for me than mm -hmm. it would be for, for a lot of people. That said, I'm like in a, a crazily hectic period right now with, um, you know, there's stuff with string joy that I got, got going on. I'm flying out there next week and, you know, a ton of like 
home projects that I've put off for years that I'm, you know, trying to get done this year. And, uh, and then on top of that, you know, just trying to be present and be, be a good dad. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot right now. And I'm looking forward to getting some of these things wrapped up and being able to get back into my normal swing of things. Cause I'm working on another EP and some other musical stuff that I've had to unfortunately back burner just because there's only so much time in the day and you got to sleep at some mm-hmm. point. So it is what it is. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> that is, I have to, I am actually just the biggest, I'm the biggest wuss with sleep. Some people can like run on three hours. If I'm mm-hmm. tired, I am the most inefficient person in the world. My brain just does not work without sleep. And I've seen people, I think, I think nobody really works without sleep to their peak efficiency, but I've seen some people who are much, well, my wife even, she can operate much better on lack of sleep than I can. I've got to get at least six in or I'm just an idiot. <laughs> like yeah. my brain just doesn't no, I hear work. You. <clears throat> but yeah, I know, I know there are some people that they're like superhuman somehow. And they're like, I haven't slept in four days and look at all this stuff I got done. I'm like, yeah, it ain't me, man. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're just like functioning alcoholics where that looks like they're keeping it together. But meanwhile, they're like messaging weird you know like when you have a pull an all-nighter and you just start like having weird conversations with people from high school or something on msn messenger or whatever <laughs> like you're just like where am i right now like like the ambient walrus kind of thing <laughs> like your brain just shuts down and you think you're doing things normally i i have a friend who's he's like i've gotten so much work done but they're like when you when you talk to him it's like you did But also, you could have got that same amount of work done and slept. You were woefully inefficient with your time. Yeah. Because you're so scattered, because you're so fried. He's like, oh, I got to stay up so I can get all this done. Sometimes that's true. But oftentimes for him, I'm like, you'd get that same amount of work done if you would just sleep. Because you spent two hours on the phone with me telling me how much work you got done. Like, in that two hours, Mm -hmm. what could you have done if you were a little sharper mentally, you know? Yeah, time management. Mm Mm-hmm. But... You know, I'm not criticizing. Everybody's got their own operational mode. Mine's just not that. So, yeah, <laughs> whatever I've been works. Staying up till till about four every night since I got back from Mexico. Just all the stuff there is to do still on this amp. We actually got it going. I think this week we finally hit the point where everything was working, which was mm-hmm. nice. And then I went, oh, there's all the other stuff to do, the website. Now I'm like, oh, I should design T-shirts. So I spent an entire day. You would think, oh, I just throw a logo on a T-shirt and I'm done. But I think it was like seven or eight hours of like, oh, this color or that color or this or the text here. And there's just, there's endless work when it comes to this stuff. But yeah, pulling like till four in the morning, basically every night and then waking up and uh, and then just hopping back on it. I, I think a lot of people, and myself included, prior to like diving more into this stuff, they don't really realize, like, it took us three months to do the rebrand for Stringjoy. And that was with, a, like, a team of people working on it, you know? And it mm-hmm. doesn't seem like it should take that long. It seems like it should be much faster than that. You'll come up with a good idea, mm-hmm. you'll execute, boom. But then you have to think about, like, how does it look in this position? Does this work on a t-shirt? Does this work on this side of the box? Do you want to put this here? Or Like everything has to be considered if you want to do it right. And I mm-hmm. think until you've actually had a hand in that process, uh, you don't realize how intensive that can really be. And it's like, oh, this is why graphic design is a full-time job for people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause then you, you put the whole thing together and you export the files and you go, oh, that looks good. You put on a t-shirt and you go, ah, you know what, on that background, I've got to cut out this, this, and this. Then you go back and you do all that and then you go, oh, you know what? And so I've got like 37 variations and probably like 15 files that say this is the final one of, (laughs) you know, the design. And and it's funny because you show stuff to people and they go, oh, that looks nice. And it's like, yeah, but you have no idea the, the journey from here to there, what that took. And if you just look at it and then people judge that based on what they see finally, you go, ah, it's okay. And you're like, yeah, but from where the idea started, like start with nothing and then end up here and mm-hmm. see how much there is in between. It's it's mind blowing. Even to me to watch my own process is like, wow, this is a lot more involved than I would have guessed. Everything is, you know? Yeah. I think there's very few things in life that are, uh, what I've realized is that everything is 
kind of what you think it is to a degree. You know, before I knew anything about guitar strings, I was like, is it really just like metal wrapped around metal? And it's like, it is metal wrapped around metal. You know, it's like, and but in doing that, there's infinite variables of how you can wrap yeah. that metal around that metal and whether that's yeah. going to work or not. And it's precisely it's, this way, that's the good way. Yes, exactly. And and some people do it a different way, and it it's it's so crazy to like this is, should be just like a one step process. You just wrap it around, mm-hmm. but no, it's it's so much more than that. And it's that way with everything. You look at pedals, and you're like, is it really just like soldering all those components to a circuit board? It's like it is, but there are infinite ways you can solder those components mm-hmm. to a circuit board, and if you do yeah. them just slightly different, even a layout. Like the same yeah, circuit who makes laid those out components. differently. Yeah, yeah. It, it's crazy. So, and that's why it's the uh, that's why these things are all I like like the graphic design thing are full time jobs for somebody, you mm-hmm. know, because there's so many ways to do it. That's a that's an interesting concept, like the infinite monkeys, infinite typewriters thing. Like yeah. because <laughs> of hu- humanity, like we're basically running a simulation where like we're all like the data in this computer. And I, I bring it back to Mexico again, where you like think of tacos and you go, oh, well, it's a corn tortilla, some form of meat, lettuce, tomato, uh, maybe cilantro. Like it's like maybe 10 things. How how mm-hmm. many ways could you put that together? And every single place you go to, it tastes different. Yep. And it comes down to the care uh, of the person doing it. Like, you know, do they think about, oh, maybe I'll try this ingredient or I'll source these things fresh. Or they just go, this is how I learned it. I'm just going to slap it together. Or, you know, their parents did it a certain way. Like there's all these millions of variables that end up with this thing. And and the same thing with like all these fuzz pedals. And that's where the obsession comes from is like, if I use this transistor, then we'll get, ex- you know, like, and you can't, even, there's not even concepts to describe it anymore. Like you're just like, oh, this fuzz has kind of like a lemony electrical, you know, tingle, <laughs> you know, you get to this point where you're like, oh, that's woolly. Like, how is, how is it woolly? You know what I mean? Right. Because there's so, there's so many fine nuances in it, like flavor almost. And, and that's the fun. Like, I think that's why we do this is, is those little things. And the more, the longer you do it, the more you can pick those out. We're like uh, wine tasting, but for sound. Yes. A hundred percent. That is a great analogy, actually. It's like, oh, this one, I mean, Wine is actually really similar in that you're like, oh, yeah, this one tastes like tobacco, olive oil, and lemon juice. And it's like, does it, though? Like, is, Or does it taste like wine? And, you know, yeah. the more you do it, the more you can pick those things out. And in my palate and for... Are you, cr- uh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and are you trying to get drunk or are you trying to enjoy the flavors? You know, right. are you just trying to play loud or, or are those things important to you? Mm-hmm. And whatever, either way is fine. It's just know mm-hmm. what your goal is and know what you're trying to yeah. do. Some people are just trying to play loud, and that's fine. Yeah, play loud. Some people are really trying to sample the sound and like, huh? Mm-hmm. It's interesting that overtone that happens specifically on an A, you know, but it doesn't mm-hmm. happen on a G. Weird. And I wonder some people if we can't have like that receptors out. in our brain for that pleasure. Like if because it does give you a form of pleasure, else we wouldn't do it. Like everything has a reward, right? Like totally. The, when you do that and your amp sounds good and that's exactly what I'm doing is trying to hit those centers in my brain that go, oh yeah. When I, you know, <laughs> with the real spring or like dialing in the, the tone exactly where it's like, oh, that feels good. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Well, let's see. We are closing in on the end of the podcast, at least the main episode. And I think that, I think that I've asked you the classic questions already because yeah, Mm-hmm. Yeah, it hasn't been that long since you've been on. Those were already I'm part a Taurus. of the program. You're a Taurus? Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. You're one of the Earth signs. I just found out about that yesterday. I don't know what any of that means. On but, Instagram. Uh, <laughs> apparently, I'm one of the fire signs. I mean, like, how, how many ways can we break down these star things? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm just. <laughs> it's really important to, to people nowadays. I think the younger generation is super. It came back. There's kind of like a cycle for that kind of stuff. The 70s was huge on astrology. Yeah. And then the 90s, they're into hair gel, and then it came, it's coming back. The hair gel or the, or the, uh, <laughs> the Maybe astrology? Maybe both. I'm seeing, I think it's both. funny, I'm seeing kids now dressing like the 90s, like the yes. bucket hats and the things. I know this makes you sound like an old person, but you see this and you're like, wow, that wasn't cool when I was younger, and now it's not cool again. But they, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's so funny to see that cycle live. Oh, yeah. Now, I've said this before on the podcast, but now 90s mom jeans are like, in again there used to be a whole an snl <laughs> yeah. skit about that you know like yeah. now they're now they're trendy again i literally yeah. like walk over to my friends like 
my friend's house and his 14 year old daughter, I'm like, I'm old now, aren't I? Because I don't understand mm-hmm. this. Yep. You know, I don't understand yep. it. We crossed the line. We are old. But uh, oh, yeah. Anyway, so we are. So we are closing in there. We should. Yeah, we're closing in. And you. Person. Yeah, I know you have some things you got to plug. So let's do that real quick before I, I ask you some new questions. Well, it's I, it's less of a plug, just some information for people. Uh, I'm doing the new Nomads. We're doing a run of 300 this time, so it is a limited number. Uh, I mean, there should be enough for everybody, but the demand is, like, I've been getting, every day I was in Mexico, I'd get a new message saying, when are they coming out? And I was like, oh, maybe I should go back to Canada and make some more. <laughs> but uh, so I'm doing that, and I'm launching the pre-sale. I guess this is going to come out probably on the 30th, this recording. So... By the time this recording is out, I think the pre-sale will have already been open a day or two, so there'll still be some available, um, and those will be on templodevices.com, the pre-sale. And then it's going to take probably two months for manufacturing, two to three months. Uh, so by the end of the summer, they should be shipping to people. And then I'm also making T-shirts and other stuff. The splices are available right now, but the uh, the Nomads are coming out. They're going to be awesome. Uh, I'm really excited about them. And, and yeah, you just hop on the website and the pre-sale is now. And the reason I'm doing that is because like I could do a Kickstarter. My investor's long gone. <laughs> he took off in code. He's like, ah, I'm going to stop putting money into this. Uh, so I've been like just floating for a year and a half now on on the these sales and just t- taking that money and turning it back in. So we're doing a pre-sale, taking that money and using the money from the pre-sale to pay for the the large manufacturing process. And then, cool. yeah, that's how we keep keep it going. There you go. Right on, everybody. So yeah, go check that out. You see, you heard the you heard the website. It'll be in the show notes, so you can just click that, and it'll take you right where you need to go. So, I don't remember if I asked this specific one last time, so we'll get into it. But I'm gonna change up the last question that everybody's used to hearing, and I know, shame on me. But first of all, what's your favorite boss pedal? EQ. The EQ. Oh, yep, I remember that now from. It, it's coming mm-hmm. back into my brain. You were the, one of the EQ fans because you can just this, you can shape your sound however you need it in the moment. It's it's just been really versatile. I mean, there's lots of great boss pedals. Don't get me wrong. If I had to go for if I want to come up with a second one, I'd say the slow gear. Oh yeah, the slow gear is fun. It's very fun. Yeah. It's hard to find, but it's a fun yeah. pedal. Definitely. All right. Now normally I ask about pizza, and everybody knows that. But since you've been on before, and we've already talked about that. And you just spent all this time in Mexico. Let's talk mm-hmm. about your very favorite taco. What is your favorite kind of taco or the f- best taco you've ever had? I would say it's a Thai. My, my go-to is called suadero, which is mm-hmm. like the meat of the face of a cow, which sounds okay. gross. I thought, it was, I thought it was rib meat for the longest time. I just learned this a year ago. And it's like, oh, it isn't the same as costilla, but it's not. So... Suadero is like the, the the head meats of the cow. It's very tender. It's like m- more tender than ribs, basically, mm-hmm. uh, is, a, is a go-to. But probably my f- all-time favorite is called Cochinita Pibil, which is uh, traditionally from like Yucatan area. And it's, they slow cook a pig on in a metal container underground on coals for like a day Ooh. or two. It's yeah. kind of like and Hawaiians. Just, like they yeah. kind of do that. It yeah. Just falls apart. And there's this place in uh, in Tulum. I used to live in Tulum. I don't anymore because Instagram murdered it. But it used to be a lot more chill. And there's this place there called uh, Honorario. And it's right in the town, not on the beach. And if you go there, they make their own tortillas that are amazing. They're just, I don't know, they're, they're different than other tortillas. They're not dry. Um, and then they do cochinita. And it's probably the best taco I've ever had in my life. Oh, man. That sounds... I think I'm having tacos for dinner tonight now. Yeah. I've been Adelina's here I come. That's my local favorite taco truck. I, I think that's on the menu tonight. So that sounds tremendous. One of these days, I need to get back to Mexico. I haven't been down there since uh wow, since my honeymoon a long time ago. And we didn't really know what we were doing. We were kind of just touristing around and we pretty much uh-huh. just hit all the tourist trap spots. And now that yeah. I I I'm a little more hip to that stuff. I'm like, okay, now we gotta we gotta go and we gotta hit the where are the locals eating? That's where we want to go. That's, that's I gotta say I gotta just put a word out for the North American listeners. If you don't know already, Mexico is a wonderful country. I think a lot of people have preconceptions about it. Um, I I love it there. I've I mean, you know, every country has its ups and downs and stuff happens, but I've never really felt 
unsafe there that much. Uh, and I don't go to resorts or anything. Like I, I go to just little towns and get an apartment or something. I also speak Spanish pretty fluently, so that, that helps a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's such an amazing country. Like so much color and life and art. And it's just, it's a different way of doing everything. Like again, like the same ingredients can make two different tacos. The same thing with like life. If you have all the same ingredients to make a country, but you have a different mindset doing it, like everything's just slightly different. And you go down there and if you go with like this, this attitude of like openness and you go, oh, that's how you do that here. That's interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much about it that I love. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a different culture. Like you say, it's just a, they sounds like, you know, token white dude but like it's just it's got so much more flavor to it than like you know we put mayonnaise on everything and i don't mean that in just in life in in cuisine but also in life you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) they and they spice everything up you know whether it's musical or art or uh, just in the way that they decorate their their houses and stuff is just it's completely different yeah i find that about like the french canadians of uh of canada as well there's it's more of a latin approach to life. And I think to, to distill it, if I could, would be, I think they're less worried about death and more involved in life. You mm-hmm. know, like they're, they're less worried about like maybe saving for the future or, or don't, you know, get the rug dirty. It's more like enjoying everything because they understand, especially like, like the day of the dead is to remember the dead and, and acknowledge death, right? Like memento mori kind of thing where you know, you're going to die. So don't worry about it. Right. And, and right. that just frees them up where I find like in the, let's say the English speaking part of Canada or maybe some like British influenced culture in North America is that kind of like everything needs to be orderly or, or it's going to be, you know, bad news kind of thing. Everybody's a little bit anxious all the time. So like I find road rage here. I got back to Canada and road rage is so much, people are so annoyed if you go slow or you didn't signal. And in Mexico, like I've almost been run over on my skateboard and we both look at each other and we're like, Oh, or didn't die. Okay, have a good day. Like, and, you know, <laughs> it's just a different vibe. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. Well, dude, <clears throat> ooh, excuse me. Uh, I feel like that's a pretty good spot to wrap up for the main podcast. Thank you for coming on. Mm-hmm. This was a great chat. Thanks I knew I was going to enjoy it because yeah. I really enjoyed the last one. So <laughs> we'll segue over to Patreon and uh, we'll tell everybody bye for now, I think. We'll see you over there. All right. For Scott, this is Blake. And as always, folks, Good luck and good tones. All right, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And again, like I mentioned in the beginning, the Patreon is even better, in my opinion. We get really weird on that one. So, I mean, all kinds of different things from the effects of plants to how they may communicate with each other to who knows what. We went down to some very strange places on that one, which was really, really fun. And I also wanted to remind everyone... If you are buying gear, if you are wanting to support the show through your gear buying, you can go to tonemob.com slash sweetwater or tonemob.com slash reverb, and those are in the show notes. So if you do any purchasing through either of those links, that comes back and helps support the show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. I would really, really appreciate that, and I really want to give a huge shout out and thank you to everyone who does use those links. So... Anyway, without further ado, well, what do you mean without further ado? You're done. What are you talking about, Blake? You're losing it. You've cracked. Let the people go. Stop talking. Okay, goodbye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company. And I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to tonemob.com slash stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things. And by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style. Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. 
We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out. 